Great, welcome everybody. Uh, if you just joined us, please put your name, your pronouns, chapter in the chat. Also, if you have a connection to, to a public school. Um, my name is Gustavo, he, he and pronouns. I'm in New York City DSA, and I'm on the steering committee um, for this campaign. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna be Organi uh, facilitating tonight, presenting together with Laura, Gabby, and Eric, and I'll pass it on to Laura to introduce herself. Yeah, hi everybody, Laura, Gabby, um, she, her, her pronouns. I, um, I'm in the New York City DSA chapter, recently moved to um, North New Jersey. Um, my, my main focus in DSA so far has been mostly um, labor work, um, part of the labor branch in New York City DSA, and also on the, um, the DSLC steering committee, that's our um, national labor body. I'll pass it over to Eric. Hi everybody, great to see so many people. Uh, my name is Eric. Uh, I was for a long time a teacher, and public education organizer, I was on the Bernie campaign. Now I'm, uh, I'm on the steering committee of the Green New Deal for Schools campaign uh, helping with educator outreach and I'm excited about talking about it with you all. Cool, so let's get started. I'm gonna share my screen, one second. Can you all see this? Yep. Great. So um, we just started this campaign about a month ago. Um, we know that um, we're in the middle of a climate crisis. Um, the ocean was literally on fire not too long ago, which is the background of this image. Um, there was a, a pipeline leak in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and, um, you know, it combusted. Um, we faced um, really severe drought and heat waves and fires this summer. In New York, um, our subways have been flooding. Um, workers are facing terrible conditions, unbearable heat, um, you know, in, in factories and warehouses. Um, workers who have to work outside um, are also, you know, bearing the brunt. Um, and although, um, Biden said that infrastructure, climate infrastructure would be one of his top priorities. Um, we're seeing a lot of obstruction in Congress and um, it's kind of been a slow frustrating process. Um, so we really want to contest the federal infrastructure fight that's happening right now. Um, by demanding a democratic green stimulus that's going to, rather than funnel money toward consultants and private contractors that will um, defend the public sector and rebuild it and expand um, you know, democratic green infrastructure. Um, and we decided to focus on this bill, um, the Green New Deal for Public Schools, um, because first of all, there's, it's always been a huge challenge within the Green New Deal that it's sort of a, a, a pretty vague framework. There isn't a, a concrete demand um, within it. Um, and the, on top of that, the climate movement is made up of a very specific um, sociological base. Um, it doesn't it's not really drawing from the full working class, uh, the working class itself being extremely disorganized as, as all of us know. Um, and the, the climate movement does not have really the power to, to win a lot of the demands that we wanna make. Um, so this bill, it's sort of a test case for our theory of change. We know that basically every, every DSA chapter Every community has something at stake in this fight because there's a, a public school 
pretty much in every chapter and every chapter is like region. Um, it affects multiple sectors of the labor movement. Um, environmental justice is like a huge part of, um, of the fight since many of the public schools that most need funding are in black and brown communities and also working class poor areas in general. Um, and it's really uh, an opportunity to make an argument um, to put public goods uh, at the heart of this fight. Um, so I'm gonna go over the bill details a little bit. Um, Jamal Bowman introduced it in the house recently uh, with DSA members at the, the bill launch in the Bronx in his district. We had both a DSA member and a YDSA member, but we didn't really know that the YDSA member was going to be there until we got there. It was pretty funny. Um, he just came up to us like after and told us he was in YDSA. He was just like a random high school student that um, Jamal Bowman had invited to talk. Um, so the bill, would, if it passed, it would um, allocate $1.4 trillion over 10 years to K through 12 public schools. And it would divide that money up into basically three categories. Um, the first one would be for retrofitting the actual facilities, that's the first bucket. Um, and it would be a mix of grants and low interest and no interest loans. Um, and the grants would be prioritizing the highest need schools. Um, there are 100,000 public schools in the US. Um, so 33,000 would be getting grants, uh, I think an average of like 7 million per school. Um, and that would be, you know, creating um, hopefully union labor, uh, construction jobs um, to remove asbestos, lead pipes, um, to reduce the, the greenhouse gas emissions that um, buildings create, which is considerable. Um, and it would also, because um, public schools actually um, are such a substantial part of the uh, building stock nationwide, um, it would start to create um, a paradigm for retrofitting buildings at a massive scale, which this country has ever done and really needs to happen to, to prevent the climate crisis. Um, so it would create 1.3 million jobs per year, um, mostly union jobs and right to work sticks, a little different. Um, it would um, also undo historic inequities across districts um, the other um, the other two buckets are would be for increased staffing in schools and also for Title I funds and IDEA grants. And um, one of the one of the things that I've learned about um, education policy through this bill is that you know because public schools are currently mostly funded, through, they're mostly funded locally and through extremely regressive means, um, through property taxes. Um, it's really an important uh, demand on the left to, to start making the federal government um, fund public education, which it uh, doesn't really do at a very large scale right now. And historically, the federal government has been reluctant to, to get involved. Federal funding for public education was one of the core demands of the civil rights movement um, as a way to, uh, to desegregate schools and to make school funding um, less regressive, more equitable, and, and really to, to create salt, like in public schools a solidaristic structure. So Congress right now um, is kind of a shit show. Um, there are two um, infrastructure bills with negotiations happening simultaneously for both. One of them is the bipartisan bill, which has been the one that's gotten the most headlines lately because it's um, the closest to passage. 
And the other one, which is the one that we're going to be contesting more, is the reconciliation bill, which is uh, the goal is for um, it to be passed only with Democrats, with the 50 votes in the Senate and um, their votes in the House. Um, there, the fiscal year in Congress ends September 30th, and so that's our immediate deadline for this campaign, although the goal is that through this campaign, we can um, build a base that we can continue, that will endure, can continue to organize beyond September 30th, of course. So basically the bill, we wanna use the bill to influence how the money in the infrastructure built, bill is spent. Uh, we wanna make sure that there is funding allocated toward public schools and um, toward making them green. Uh, I'll go over the campaign plan briefly. We have some target universes that we want to um, focus on. Basically, labor, within labor, school workers, and building trade workers who would most immediately benefit. And then communities, parents, and students themselves. Um, we're asking most chapters to um, select a target campaign school based on a strategic congressional, dis con congressional district and also um, uh, based on the 33,000 schools that would be um, eligible for grant, grant aid. And the main tactics right now are gonna be canvassing, um, petition collecting, and then recontacting um, supporters to invite them to join local campaign committees. And so far we've been having weekly Tuesday calls um, at 8 p.m. Eastern with chapter leads from all over the country um, so that people can troubleshoot um, how their campaigns are going and, and we can talk about, you know, staying on top of uh, our goals. The campaign timeline or steps right now, campaigns are forming. We're asking chapters to, to vote on resolutions to make this a priority campaign for those chapters. Um, then we are asking chapters to select target schools, to select political targets in Congress, um, and to start setting up a field schedule and, um, and you know, an organizing committee in the school of leads um, within the chapters, I mean. Um, and then in August and September, which we're in now, um, we really want to start um, carrying out field work and eventually escalating in September. Um, either with things like town halls or rallies and direct actions, um, or potentially we've, we've been talking about um, at the national level, uh, trying to organize high school student walkouts in September. And if you want to um, sign up, I'm going to drop uh, the interest form link in the chat right now, which I'll do um, periodically. And then I will pass it on to Laura. Okay, thanks. Um, just getting set up here again. Um, so I, I wanted to talk basically a little bit about, um, about labor and about the building trades in particular and kind of how, um, how I see the trades fitting into this campaign um, and, and kind of some of the actions that we can start to take as DSA to get um, building trades people more involved, to get educators more involved. Um, so I, I guess to start, I wanted to give a bit of a background about, about the union building trades. Um, 
for anybody who's not super familiar. So like, what does the union building trades really care about? Um, and like, I would say the number one thing is it really as, you know, as a whole cares about jobs. Um, we, you know, our work is precarious, even though um, I, I'm in the carpenters union here in New York City, even though I'm in a union, um, the jobs are short term, they're temporary, um, layoffs come easily, you get sent to another job. Um, and so our unions are always kind of scrambling for like where the work is going to come next. Um, like it might be busy now, but it's not going to be busy forever. This is just the constant concern in the building trades. Um, and this is, you know, this is for members and, um, and staff alike. Um, and, uh, you know, in, so in the building trades, we always get busier in the summer. And a big part of that is because we do schoolwork in the summer, because the only time during the year that you can actually um, usually get into the buildings to do work is for three months in the summer. Um, so that's, that's a huge part of our work in the summer. Um, I learned to do, um, I'm a ceiling carpenter. I learned to do ceilings um, at an elementary school um, on the Lower East Side, on East Broadway. Um, so it's this big important part of our work. Um, but like Gustavo was saying, the way it's, um, you know, a lot of it's regressively funded right now. It's, um, you know, it's, it's, through, um, it's through property tax. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I wanted to highlight too, just, I think that school conditions, so improving school conditions, it's an issue that in my time talking to educators seems to be very widely and deeply felt. Um, a few years ago, before this campaign was even happening, um, I was at Labor Notes and in a group of other educators, and we ended up talking about this almost all day. People were talking about the terrible conditions in their classroom, um, about the lack of ventilation, having you know a window that opens like three inches, and that's their like ventilation. Um, and we had this really kind of amazing connection because we had a few building trades people in the room, and it's like that should be our work. Like that's that's work that we're basically not getting, um, and. Um, you know, I think it's just potentially a really powerful, um, a powerful coalition and a powerful combination. Um, so the, the building trades is always trying to get work, but especially when things slow down, when there's a recession um, and the pandemic has certainly um, caused a slowdown in the building trades. So, so it's especially people are looking for new ideas. People are looking for the next thing. Um, some of the challenges of moving um, the building trades um, towards a Green New Deal. Um, we do, we, we're on the more conservative end of unions um, and, and membership. Um, although that's not true across the board, there's definitely exceptions in terms of, um, of certain unions and, and among a lot of the membership. Um, our, our work is sometimes in direct conflict with the Green New Deal. So there's a lot of building trades workers um, work on pipelines, for example. Um, the building trades is on has been on the defensive for quite a while. We've watched um, across the country. Um, the you know more and more jobs have gone non-union. Um, so this has kind of entrenched the union building trades in a way of like playing defense all the time, just trying to protect what we have, protect what we have, um, instead of kind of thinking ahead to um, you know to something like the Green New Deal that could potentially bring a lot of work. Um, you know, with, with some exceptions, most, most locals don't have a super aggressive um, organizing strategy. Um, and I think, you know, I think IUPAT is certainly, um, certainly an exception. You know, they, they were a key coalition partner in our product campaign. Um, and I think there's also some, some key locals around the country where there's a lot of work that we could really be doing um, with the leadership too. Um, so these are kind of some of the challenges um, but there's, you know, there's some real opportunities also um, in the building trades, there's a chance to be directly placing people that would be losing work into new green jobs. Um, you know, despite, despite some, some of the high level leadership, many building trades workers are fed up with working conditions and, and want to actually fight the bosses. There, are, there is a lot of frustration at the jobs and people looking to organize and looking to do more. Um, and I think also um, 
really powerful would be seeing it in practice. So seeing some of these, you know, if we were to get a bill passed, seeing it in practice and seeing all the jobs that it creates would really, um, would really sway a lot of people. Um, so where does DSA kind of fit into this? Um, so, you know, we, we have started, um, you know, the D I'm, so I'm on the DSLC and we have lists of, um, of union members across DSA and we've, you know, started last spring doing outreach to, um, to building trades workers in DSA. Um, we've held a meeting and we've talked about having a network, um, but we haven't really had a major campaign to cohere around. Um, and this, this campaign, I think, is a huge opportunity um, for us to start to build up a building trades network in DSA. Um, we have 200 some odd building trades people um, in DSA, not all of whom have been contacted, um, but this is very exciting to me that we can start to coordinate um, across the country and, and in our locals. Um, it's also, this campaign is something tangible to recruit coworkers to. Um, so, you know, I, I occasionally bring coworkers to a labor branch meeting. I try to bring people only to stuff that I think is gonna be really, really useful to them. And this campaign fits into that. This is something that I can directly recruit coworkers to um, because there's, there's a direct connection. I can say like, this is potentially gonna win us work. Um, also, if you are a parent, which many building trades workers are, um, you know, this, you know, what kind of school can, is, is your kid in? Like what, kind, what are the conditions in the school? Um, and um, last, I just wanted to talk about um, or touch on briefly the long-term strategy. So this is a, you know, this campaign timeline goes through the end of September. We're working on a specific piece of legislation. Um, but I think that it also points to um, the idea that we need to be organizing long-term um, in the building trades, in, um, you know, in, uh, in teachers unions and in logistics. Um, and we're going to need long-term, we're going to need socialists in some of these key industries organizing long-term. Um, we need people there for five or 10 years. We need people to be deeply organizing and really know their coworkers and be able to move them long-term. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it over to, to Eric to talk a little bit more about, um, about educators and, uh, and where educators and schools fit into this. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Laura, and thanks everybody. It's it's great to see so many people. It truly is exciting. We, we were on it. We were on the planning call for this before, and we're like, we have no, we literally have no idea how many people we're going to get on. Uh, so I think it speaks to something that a lot of us feel, which is the urgency, uh, not only to prevent catastrophic climate change, not only to save our schools for our students for ourselves who are educators, but also to connect. DSA in a much deeper way with the broader labor movement and the working class, you know? And so, so what's so exciting about this campaign is it brings all of these things together. Um, I'm gonna touch on the educators piece. Um, and th the first thing just to stress is for those of you who aren't edu in, in education, uh, maybe you're not aware, but you probably are aware if you're in DSA of just how urgently we need infrastructure in the school. So even if we put aside the climate piece. The reality is, uh, even as over these last few weeks, I've, as I've been calling like every educator I know across the country to get them involved in the campaign, the interesting thing is a significant number of them have been like, oh yeah, we, this is great. We were already planning on our local district of fighting for infrastructure because uh, just the schools are crumbling after COVID uh, and during COVID still for many places. Um, the conditions are just unsustainable. Um, it's been unsustainable for a long time and it's been sort of insult to injury now with, uh, you know, to give an example, New York, the most common response I hear when I talk to teachers about the, the bill or this in general is this like, yeah, we can't, we literally can't even open the windows in uh, half of our classrooms. And, you know, in Arizona and in a lot of red states in particular, the infrastructure is even, is even worse. Uh, you know, you have very, you have crumbling buildings. This is sort of the norm in the United States, despite being the most 
uh, affluent country in the world. So, so there's an urgency that is widely felt, irrespective of this campaign, that we need to win uh, the things that our students and our educators need, just to like have basic functioning schools, you know, things that we should take for granted. So um, this bill speaks to that felt need, and that I think should help us uh, turn this into a real organizing opportunity and not just sort of a one-off flash in the pan. I would add to that the, the urgency of this is, is deepened by the whole dynamic of the pandemic on a couple ways. The, the first is the educators movement was, uh, as many of you know, one of the few parts of labor that has really been fighting back uh, for a long time, uh, at least since 2008 and some places longer. And the pandemics put a lot of this education movement, Red Fred movement on the defensive. It's gone to like local district fights just to, um, you know, about school closure, uh, you know, things like that. This allows the educators movement as a whole to move back into the offensive and to reshape the narrative about educators fighting for the schools that our students deserve, right? Um, and that's essential because without that, we're not gonna be able to um, kind of rebuild the fighting labor we need in general or, or uh, turn the movement around education. The second major reason I just, I think that the campaign is extremely strategic and I hope you also uh, are excited about it is that as I mentioned before, it brings together a lot of key issues. And the big picture idea, I think, of the campaign, like a lot of Green New Deal organizing in general, is that we're not gonna be able to win the transformational uh, Green New Deal we need without a fighting labor movement. But this is a big problem, because as you know, there isn't really a big fighting labor movement in the United States today. So this poses quite a contradiction and a dilemma. Um, but that's why schools are so strategic, in particular, because the one part uh, maybe together with healthcare um, that has had, uh, you know, relatively consistent uh, union organizing and strikes in the recent period is public education. Um, you know, there's been state, uh, red state strikes, there's been blue state strikes, there's been walkouts to, uh, you know, to make sure that schools stayed uh, safe during the pandemic, all of that. And so what we're trying to do with the campaign, both in the short term and the long term, is to connect that fighting part of the working class to this broader vision of fighting, not just for students, but really for all of society and the whole world by preventing catastrophic climate change. Um, and so DSA in turn has a role to play in that as helping further both of that connection process. And in this process, DSA educators and DSA chapters, you don't have to be an educator, can play a crucial role in helping scale up this campaign in the short term. And the, the thing I would emphasize is twofold um, as far as the arc of the campaign. One is it's extremely urgent in the short term because there's this huge infrastructure bill that is about to get voted on in September. So in some ways we're really at a time crunch uh, that I can't really impress upon any of you enough how little time we have in the short term to try to scale up our organizing and mobilizing to try to put enough pressure on Congress so that they don't just capitulate um, and keep out climate and education funding. It's entirely possible. We don't know what's happened. We know that there's a lot of pressure from the mansions and from the Republicans of the world and from the Democratic Party establishment in general to uh, keep this infrastructure bill as uh, unrobust as possible. So unless, unless there's a, uh, a, a serious pushback on our side from the left in the streets, in our schools, through walkouts, um, and in Congress, things like that, then it's not likely we're gonna be able to get the funds we need. And there's, we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars that are up in play right now. So the, what we do in the short term can make a real difference for um, you know, hundreds of thousands of students and educators, if not more. And I'll end with that, if we can make a win on even in the short term, get, you know, it's, it's very unlikely that we're gonna get uh, Jamal Bowman's entire bill passed uh, in the next two months. This is, you know, this is not really, um, this is a longer term vision that uh, we can also win some short term concessions with. If we can make some wins and push the envelope, that's going to give the energy we need to have a long sustained organizing drive 
to win a Green New Deal in general and a Green New Deal for schools. So I think I'm excited about the campaign. I think you all hopefully would be, should be too, because we can have a, both a short-term next few months win that will then in turn give us uh, the inspiration to fight for much more and to further deepen our organizing systematically with educators, climate change movement, um, and DSA over the next years. So I'll leave it at that. And I think I'll pass it to Gustavo just to lay out what we're gonna do for the last part of the workshop. Yeah, so we're mostly gonna do a Q&A for the rest of the, um, of the hour. We have half an hour left, I guess, 25 minutes. Um, and I'm gonna, um, I just wanna reiterate um, Eric's point that, you know, uh, this is really a generational fight that's happening in Congress. Um, over infrastructure funding. Um, I think it'll be years before uh, we get another opportunity to, to fight for this, this amount of stimulus. Um, the Bi it's not going to be a Green New Deal. Obviously, Biden is not um, on our side or a socialist. Um, but uh, it is, um, you know, we've already seen um, multi-billion, multi-trillion dollar stimulus packages passed. Um, the child um, tax credit um, is pretty significant. And so I do think that it is possible to win um, concessions. Um, and I just wanna put in the chat, like a quick call to action. We're going to have um, a, um, a launch call, a national launch call with DSA. Um, with Jamal Bowman on Tuesday, right after the convention ends. Um, so that's Tuesday, August 10th at 8 p.m. And um, Jamal Bowman, he will be, um, he's gonna stick with us. He's gonna be there for like an hour and wants to do Q and A with us. Um, so I think it'll be really interesting um, and like kind of more interactive than a lot of these calls usually are. Um, so I really um, want to urge you all to, to register and also commit to registering three other people in your chapter or whatever um, to get on next Tuesday's call. And also you should all post about it. It's 8 p.m. Eastern. Yes, that's the link um, to sign up. Um, so post about it on Twitter, put it in all your Signal chats, WhatsApp threads, whatever. Discord. Um, and um, let's go to, um, also, by the way, as I mentioned, we have two, uh, Tuesday night campaign calls with chapter leads. And if your chapter is not represented there already, if you want to be a chapter lead, please email us um, at the Green New Deal campaign committee email that Nadia just put, I think, in the chat. Tonight's call is happening at eight, right after this call, 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, but I assume it'll be a small one. Um, okay, so for um, questions, is there a question box on this or are, do we just wanna use the chat? Um, let's just use Stack. Uh, like if you wanna ask a question, you can, um, you can just type stack into the chat. Um, and I'll put some, I'll, I'll re repost all the sign up links and calls to actions, to action uh, at the end of this call. Um, I saw earlier um, that um, Theo was asking, how does this bill, um, differ um, from the false promises of the Obama administration? How does it avoid tailing the Biden administration? Um, I think this is very important. We know that um, the, the dominant neoliberal consensus in Washington um, uh, is you know, opposed to what we want. Um, but you know, in during the Obama administration, in those years, there was really no climate movement to speak of. There was no outsider pressure at all. Um, there was really very few, very little um, grassroots organizing. That's changed quite a bit since 2016. Um, the left has grown in power, uh, and we can see that 
simply um, in the scale of, the, of what's being proposed in the current infrastructure bill versus what Obama proposed. Um, so Obama passed the stimulus right after the 2008 financial crisis called um, the uh, ARRA, American Recovery something, um, something. Uh, and it was 800, uh, $800 billion. Um, they didn't want to go over one trillion because of Larry Summers, um, who was Obama's, you know, Wall Street economic advisor. Um, and of that entire bill, only about eighty or ninety billion was devoted to creating um, any kind of green infrastructure. So it was a very weak promise to begin with. Um, we're on a, a much more massive scale uh, as the starting point now. Um, we're also like um, making a demand that that a lot of um, congressional leadership um, is uh, opposed to. Um, like uh, we are, we've had pretty close talks with Bowman and with his uh, staff, his office, uh, and like it was sort of a risk for them to introduce this bill um, because the chair of the relevant committee has his own schools bill that's much more conservative. Um, and so um, uh, Bowman is sort of um, taking on the, the congressional leadership. And the reason that he's doing that is because we told him that we would have his back and that like DSA was willing to throw down and the, that we can really make this a live fight. Um, so I'll leave it there. Um, Brian is next. Thank you for the uh, wonderful presentation. Um, a question I want to ask is sort of, is, I don't know how else to better to put it than like, is this campaign sort of like wholly owned by um, DSA Eco Socialists? Like, Cause like, I, I know this makes you think a lot about um, the, just like the GND campaign we already had and Medicare for all, and especially with Medicare for all, like. There, there were multiple groups nationally that were, you know, conceptually had ownership over the campaign, like our revolution and just like, you know, Medicare for all, like, like sort of like that org, you know, the, nur the nurses unions. So uh, it, it sounds like to me that this campaign is much more DSA owned than these previous national campaigns. Is that uh, conception correct? Uh, yeah, pretty much. There are other, um, there's no, um, really national table for or coalition for the bill the way that there is for, for Medicare for All. Um, it's possible that that will form um, still, still a new bill, but for now, uh, our own campaign um, is like the whole infrastructure basically with the DSA. Although Sunrise has endorsed the bill, um, AFT, um, the, the teachers, the National Teachers Union has also endorsed the bill. Um, and you know a number of other political organizations yeah i would just add yeah the i think in part it's just because things are moving very quickly you, I, the ideal thing is actually to push uh the unions to get much more involved you know it, it's it's sort of by default been uh driven largely by dsa right now um because others are have been doing other things a lot of educators unions are scrambling just you know, back to school and everything having to do with the pandemic. But uh, there is a lot of excitement. And you know, there's a lot of space because even union officials who may disagree with them, a lot of things, including like leadership of the American Federation of Teachers have like endorsed this bill. So they create space for uh, people locally to push much further and say, look, our unions uh, say they're for climate change, we, uh, for preventing climate disaster, for a Green New Deal for schools infrastructure, we need to put resources, we need our unions to put resources towards organizing, you know, and to supporting students when they walk out, things like that. So I definitely think that particularly for those of us who are in labor, we wanna be pushing uh, unions to really own the process uh, as much as possible. And um, similarly, I would hope that people at Sunrise and other sort of green, not DSA movements would push in a similar direction given the importance of the campaign. Um, let's go to Aurora. Hi, um, thanks so much for this. Uh, I'm a teacher in Ithaca, New York. And um, like 
pretty liberal town. I'm sure that like, if I just sent this to like my coworkers, people would want to sign a petition, maybe want to wear a t-shirt, whatever. Um, so I'm wondering, are there like, petitioning was one of the tactics that was on the um, PowerPoint. Like, are there small things that teachers can do right now, like without doing a major organizing push? Yes, there absolutely is. Um, I don't know, Eric, if you want to talk to this. Um, we're like a little delayed in rolling out materials, but for this stuff, but we're going to very soon, like in the next few days. Yeah, so the, the first thing I would say is, Aurora, I'll put in my email uh, on the chat and to any ed educator who's on the call right now, I should have mentioned this earlier, but I will mention it now. Uh, we have a sort of more uh, working, we have a DSA educators uh, working group on this. It's just sort of like a loose listserv that we meet every two weeks to really strategize what to do. So if anybody wants to get on, including yourself, uh, just shoot me an email and I'll add you to that. So I'm gonna put my email in the chat in a second. Um, and just more generally, I think there's a lot of space to own and to, to, to sort of figure out how you want this campaign to look locally. One of the tricky things about education, as, as mentioned, is that it, it is very decentralized. So there's ways of combining local fight backs with the national bill. And I think this is how a lot of we envision it, particularly in the schools, because we know we're not going to get everything we need by September 30th. And so using this as a, as a way to kind of generate excitement around infrastructure, clean climate, which we're gonna to have to transition after September 30th into local and statewide fights. That's really gonna be the cutting edge issue for this campaign uh, after September 30th um, in many ways. So I'm gonna drop my email in. Um, and there was also a question which I guess I can answer um, now, but I don't know Gustavo if you saw or Laura if you had, it, it says what, what does effective participation in this campaign look like? for a small medium chapter in a safe red district in a right to work state. It seems like a good vehicle for equipment and education, except that there's not much winnable locally, uh, nor can we contribute to pressure in Congress. What, what would, I mean, I have some thoughts on this, what Laura or Gustavo, would you, one, you want to address the, you know, what different, you know, particularly maybe red state context uh, might look like for this? Um, I would definitely say that uh, it's a, good potential recruitment campaign. Um, we've kind of offered two, um, two potential strategies for chapters in red states um, who don't have a, a democratic member of the house or Senate. Um, one, you can um, target Biden still. Um, or if you like, we, we, I was talking to somebody in Tulsa um, or you know, someone else from the campaign was talking to Tulsa DSA and um, they felt like Biden wouldn't really be a compelling target um, locally, but they have been targeting like one of their Republican house members and that that would be like a more motivating um target for people in the area because they already kind of like hate this person um and the the utility for the national campaign overall is that it can build um a narrative that this is actually an issue that affects everybody in the country <clears throat> that you know even people in xyz red areas are demanding a green new deal that um you know, public schools are this universal public good um, that, you know, it's politically smart to, um, to, to strengthen. There was another question on there, Gustavo, which I'll, uh, and Laura, feel free to jump in also, which was, uh, what do we tell teachers who are like so swamped with everything that, uh, you know, especially at the beginning of the school year, what do we tell them where they're like, I can't deal with this? And this is a very good question because this is definitely the major response I've gotten from a lot of educators who are like, uh, this sounds good, but I want, you know, this is like too much uh, right now. And my response to them has been like, yes, yeah, precisely because it's too much that we need uh, a national campaign to support you, you know, and, and on the table right now are hundreds of millions of dollars 
that can go in the short term to your school and schools across the country. Like this is a once in a possibly generation fight around infrastructure. And if we miss this opportunity, we are gonna be missing opportunity to like help you and your students right now. So it's not separate, you know, the, the like getting back to school uh, issues isn't separate from the immediate stakes of this bill. That I've been stressing to teachers in particular, the urgency um, and maybe to others, the, the long-term vision is, is a little bit more cogent. A lot of teachers don't have the mental wherewithal right now to think about the long-term as much. I don't know if others have those things to add on that. I have something to add just on the red state question, just that I think it can sometimes be useful to really break it down and start with um, start with where people are in terms of their issues. So, you know, if you have a few teachers in your chapter or parents of students, um, you know, getting them to possibly invite their coworkers to a meeting to kind of talk about, um, talk about issues like conditions in the school. Like you don't necessarily have to say um, right away that this is like a, um, you know, that this is a Green New Deal, a big Green New Deal campaign that's very lefty or something like that. You can start with, you know, with people's actual issues um, and, and connect it to the, to the Green New Deal legislation. And I, you know, I think, um, you know, sometimes, you know, in red states, unfortunately, and in red industries, which mine sort of is, um, you do kind of have to start like really, really zoom in on like what people's issues are and like connect those um, to the work that you're doing. So I'll just leave it at that. I saw Dennis on stack also. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad for this discussion. I think it's an important topic. I mean, there's no question that there's money in the table um, that we in, who work in education need to be fighting for. I'm, I'm a member of the Chicago Teachers Union. I was just part of a bargaining session today with uh, management around the fact that CPS got two, almost $2 billion in federal money just on their own to, for opening schools this fall. I mean, the focus that we've been putting forward at C2 hasn't really been infrastructure so much as vaccinations, um, getting more staff in the buildings, more nurses, more TAs, more, you know, uh, teaching assistants, um, contact tracers, those are the kinds of things we've been focused on. So I think it's going to be different in different cities, depending on what's going on. There is, there are a number of DSA members who are teachers. I wasn't aware that there was this, um, this national group, so that's good to know. Uh, but so one of them did reach out to maybe about seven or eight of us uh, this afternoon saying, hey, there's this national campaign, you should get involved. I do think it's going to be a challenge here specifically only because, you know, for the reason that the bill laid out, but I don't think it takes away from the overall point. Um, there's definitely money in the table. And I think even if there is um, something can be started with a, a smaller group of people, it can certainly build into something more later. I mean, who's to say what we'll win here in Chicago in terms of getting resources to where it's needed. Um, but it is, again, part of a longer term process where unions, not just in education, but in many areas are, are fighting for, for resources. There's more money out there. And how do we position ourselves as ones who are consistently fighting for us and linking that to socialist politics, uh, I think is an important question saying there needs to be a, a, a significant redistribution of wealth from the rich. You have you know, billionaires sitting them, shooting themselves off into space and yet we can't have a vaccine center in every school. It's completely outrageous. Um, and those are the kinds of messages I think that will resonate with people, but then can be used to recruit um, educators to to groups like the DSA, uh, to a socialist framework so that we can build on to the next fight, even if the one, if this one specifically doesn't end up being uh, successful. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I think we've been working with somebody in CTU uh, who set up a climate justice committee there. And- uh, Yeah, Nick Limbeck, I, I know him, he's a good guy. Cool, so um, I hope to see Chicago DSA and CTU really go down, hopefully. Um, but you brought up a good point that like, there is a lot of federal money right now going to states and cities, localities. Uh, and this is gonna really open the door for future, um, future fights and future campaigns on how that money is actually spent potentially. Um, 
So if we treat this as a base building campaign um, where we politicize new people and, and strengthen our chapters, um, that you know starts to build a base that we can um, we can bring to to fights that are coming up about how to use lo uh, federal money locally. So I just want to flag in the chat. There's a good. There's been a few questions about the petition because it's uh -huh. true. Uh, I, I just the first thing I'll say is the petition is very important because it's an organizing tool and it's also going to be a very cool organizing tool because it's it's going to be both a national petition but then um, you can use it locally at a given school or industry to do like real structure-based organizing, by which I mean, you can try to get like 50 plus one of whatever union or school or industry you're at, because you just gonna have sign off boxes and we will give you the data for this. So I can't stress enough how important the petition is. It's about, to, Gustavo, tell me if I'm wrong, if it's gonna go live tonight or tomorrow, um, but this is one of our main ways to, go out and talk with rank and file educators, with students, with parents, which is the community at large. And so if there's, you know, so there's some really easy asks, you can come be thinking out of this meeting, sometimes be overwhelming. Can you get people at your school uh, to sign? Can you get, you know, half of the people in your school sign? Can you get students, you know, to sign? Can you get them to come to the event with Bowman uh, on August 10th, right? And then a bigger ask, especially if you don't any high school students, this is my pet hope, is that if we can get even a few high schools to walk out this, uh, you know, I don't know if it'll happen. Uh, it may be not this fall, hopefully we can, there's some talk. Um, it would make it, it, we need to bring back this level of urgency around the climate struggle. You know, it's like the world is burning. Uh, we can't be just, you know, business as usual. So I think that the high school student piece is important. So for YDSA chapters, for any of you who know high school students, like encourage them. Um, and, and have you know definitely connect them. Gustavo, would you be able to give a um, update just on the petition itself? Um, no, sorry, I'm not sure uh, if it's okay. ready yet. I have to check in with Jack, who's been working on it. It'll be uh, ready any moment, so just keep your eye on it and use it, I guess. Uh, Nathan, do you want to get on stack? Yes. I guess my, my question is, um, how other groups uh, doing this? Because in, in my, my DSA chapter basically split. And some people actually tried out, we, they formed a new organization, Congressman Hall. They elected two school board members. And they have a, like a radical base of teachers and you know public workers that they've organized. The DSA chapter I'm in isn't as organized, right? And I'm so I'm trying to get these two different groups together. Uh, and it's proving to be more difficult than I thought because it's like the promo DSA members are like, why would we need DSA? You know, like they're a bunch of you know kids who don't know what to do. And the, the DSA people are like, can't be bothered to show up or don't have don't they don't it's it's not like don't trust the other people. And I'm just wondering like what your know, recommendation for me is because um, like, yeah, I'm in this organization in, in Richmond, Virginia, and we, we, you know, we have, you know, I have, you know, two school board members and my colleagues, but you know, we don't, I don't, they don't get a lot of the DSA chapter. And I just want to know if we have any ideas about how to resolve this. Um, are you saying that Richmond DSA does not want to work on this, but other groups in Richmond do? Yeah, there might be another group that is no interested. That's what I'm saying. Uh, well, Sunrise has endorsed the campaign. Um, I don't think they're going nationally. I don't think they'll really bear down the way DSA will, because they have another major priority right now. Um, but uh, Richmond, Sunrise, um, you know, could could very I'm well involved with, organize I'm involved with that. I'm involved with Richmond Sunrise too. I, I guess what I'm, say, I yeah, I guess maybe, yeah. My 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 thing is just my my chapter is really um, you know, not not a, a good place right now to do this. But I'll, I'll see what I I'll see what I can do. I'm just um. Uh, 
maybe they, they could still get, so the petition, you think like still creating a petition is a good idea? Like, could it be online? Oh, oh we probably won't be posted, but like sending out, out, out online, would that, that do something as well? Yeah. Um, if you want to stay up to date on the petition, you should sign up uh, in the link that I dropped in the chat. Um, and we're, we're going to be emailing out um, all of the tools pretty soon. Tomorrow, according to the person who's finalizing it. Cool. I think we're at time, Gustavo. Yeah. Um, thank you, everybody, so much for joining. I hope that you're all going to join the struggle and um, that we can win a Green New Deal for public schools. <laughs>